Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining me today. Monday, April 20th. Hello, hello, everyone. How is everyone doing? How was your weekend? Oh, I match, I match my background today. Welcome, welcome. Just look and see who's here. When I'm bigger, I'm blurry. So let me know, I see some names in the chat box that I recognize. Let me know. <laughs> yeah, I'm blurry today. I assume it's upstairs. My husband has the TV on before he goes to work. I can make it smaller. Uh, I guess we'll leave it for now. I'll go smaller in a little bit. Right now I'm in big size. So sorry, I'm a little bit blurry. Uh, Katie's here from Ottawa. Welcome. I see Angela here from Oakland, Maryland. Good morning. Let me know where you're from. I see a couple names in the chat box that I recognize. Um, I don't have anything prepared this morning. I will let you know about the different show notes I finished over the weekend. If you want to let us know where you're from, uh, if you have any adapted techniques or programs that you've taken, if this is your first webinar. I also, in reviewing all the footage this weekend, I realized when I'm asking guest questions, I, I do these long rolling questions, so I need to work on that. So. Uh, I see Kristen's here from St. Petersburg, Florida. Welcome. Andrea's here from Charlottesville, Virginia. Emily's here from Sarasota. Uh, Mike is here from Pennsylvania. Mike was just sending me a video about uh, a cool dummy that he was working on. So uh, we'll get more information on that shortly, probably before the next presentation. Katie's saying, all of the Florida people, I'm jealous. We we're supposed to go somewhere hot for March break, but went nowhere. <laughs> Did you see those memes on the internet, on Facebook, about the vacation where they take, you know, bedroom, kitchen, and then they make it sound something exotic? So instead of a vacation to Florida, you have a vacation to, you know, Al Bedroom or something like that. So um, definitely, we were lucky. We went on a cruise in January before things went off the rails and beautiful warm weather came back in Calgary to pretty cold weather until last week. We had some sunshine on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, which was lovely. And then, of course, this morning I woke up all excited for sunshine, warmer weather, and uh, it's not warm today. So I got my hopes up and that didn't happen. So unfortunately for that, um, it is what it is. <laughs> I haven't seen any inflatable pools in living rooms, but I am I am not unwilling to try that. I do have an inflatable dinghy. Welcome, Angela, also from Ontario. I see Natalie from Augusta, Maine. My husband actually has a retired army friend who lives not too far from Augusta, Maine. Uh, tornado warnings, Kristen saying, so <laughs> we don't need to be jealous. It's so interesting too, all across the United States, there's such different responses to COVID. So I think it's, it's interesting too, because um, just following the news a little bit over the weekend, my husband is American, he follows the news pretty closely to see the disparity between even individual states in the United States and Canada in terms of what we're doing and not looking to throw rocks at anybody. It's just interesting that there is such disparate uh, perspectives on what is um, the right thing to do. So definitely a, a tough one. Welcome Lynn from Rodale Aquatic Center, Cedar Crest College in Allentown, Pennsylvania. I feel like I'm going to have to go on a road trip next year and hit up all these facilities that I'm learning about from this webinar series. It'll be epic because this morning I was emailing with someone from Virginia. Yesterday I was emailing with someone from Austin, Texas, uh, you know, just kind of all over the United States. It's been really, really amazing. So welcome. I, I'll pop a couple things in the chat box and I am a little blurry so my apologies when we go down to presentation mode you're only going to see a little me anyway so um, you don't need too much detail. First thing I'm going to pop in the chat box is our show notes from last Wednesday. So last Wednesday April 15th Benjamin Zimmerman was here from ABC First Aid and Aquatics. He talked about starting your own business, a side gig, a full-time gig, 
and I had some delays with getting that recording up on YouTube because it recorded uh, past, um, we recorded for about two hours and then it just kept recording and recording. So I had to video edit, which took some time. So those show notes are now updated. The recordings are now there. You will see that there are two recordings. There is the first uh, standard session and then there's a follow-up session I did with Ben when we got cut off. So we've got another Katie here from Clover, South Carolina. Oh, thanks for the invite, Lynn. I would love to go, anyone will have me. I just have to figure out how I get around the US. Would love to visit. Pennsylvania, I will say, is a little bit easier um, the eastern seaboard is a little bit easier when we fly in to see my husband's kids. They live in Maryland and West Virginia, so Pennsylvania is a lot closer. Um, Marcy's here from High River. Hello, Marcy. Uh, been thinking about you two with your son away. Kendra's here from Bentonville, Arkansas. Welcome. All of the states represented. I see Cheryl Ann from High River as well. Welcome. Um, Connor's here from Sarasota, Florida. Laura's here from Sarasota. Hi, Danelle from Clara's home just down the street from me. So Danelle, you'll recognize some people in the chat box, welcome. I've just put in the chat box the webinar recording and show notes for last Wednesday. Let me also go ahead and put in the show notes for Friday. So on Friday, we had Kelly Martinez here. Uh, if you weren't able to attend, everything is now up on the link. I'll pin this one in the chat box. So Kelly Martinez from the city of Phoenix, Lifeguards Love YouTube, um, really, really amazing session on Friday. If you had any internet issues, so the way right now I appear blurry to you because the quality of the internet in Canada is not as strong as some urban areas in the US. I have been able to embed in the show notes every little link to every video that she showed. So if there's any videos that you want to rewatch for yourself because of the quality of the live stream or whether you want to create a playlist to show to your staff when you reopen, whether you'd like to send a playlist to your staff right now during COVID to have them watch, every single video that Kelly presented is now available on those show notes. So that's been a great resource. I put that together last night and um, it is shared on our Facebook page as well. So welcome. Um, I'm also seeing if you're just joining us, let us know where you're from, if you've been here before, uh, what sort of sessions you've enjoyed, which sessions you've attended. I see Deirdre here from Long Island, New York, excuse me. Ashton's here as well from Sarasota. So welcome everyone. I'm just, I've put some show notes in the chat box. One unrelated thing I'm going to mention in the pre-show because I it's been on my table now for a few days and I've forgotten. So I'll just go back a little bit and I'll put the link in the chat box. This is a publication in Canada called Pool and Spa Marketing. This is a magazine that is free. It comes out seven times a year, and you can subscribe to this magazine if you're interested. It is mostly geared towards pool operators, more of the construction and mechanical side, but it is a free magazine. I get it a couple times a year. I will put the subscriber link in the chat box. There's lots of great magazines that you can subscribe to uh, for the aquatics industry. I will also pop in the chat box, I did a blog post last year on our website about magazines. So I'll see if I can grab that. I didn't pre-plan that. One second. Lots of great magazines you can get. Oh. Also, I should mention, if you get our weekly email, like the email that I, Katie, Lakeview Aquatic Consultants, that we send out each week, it is uh, it is unfinished. I'm just finishing it up today. So if you would like to get our emails, we send them weekly. You are welcome to uh, subscribe. I'll put that link in the chat box as well. It's really important you guys know that I don't take everybody's personal email from the webinars and pop it into my email list. That's not, uh, that's not kosher in Canada for for email laws. So if you do want to get weekly emails from me during COVID or monthly when we're not in a um, <laughs> pandemic crisis, then you could subscribe to the email list. So links so far I've put in the chat box, the link to the 
Pool and Spa Marketing. It's a free magazine you can receive as an aquatics professional. The next link I'm putting in the chat box I've just published is a link to a blog post we did last year about all kinds of different magazines in the aquatics industry that you can subscribe to for free. Some are published and some are e-magazines. And then the last link I'll put in the chat box for now, as we're letting people kind of enter in, we've still got lots of time, is if you want to subscribe to the email list for Lakeview. So I'll be sending out an email probably two or three o'clock this afternoon, mountain time. I'll get that done. So welcome, everyone. If you're just joining us, say hello. Let me know what's new. What are you up to? If you have any questions for me, I'm here. I don't have anything specific planned. We have Swim Angel Fish in about 15 minutes. So thanks for spending part of your morning with me. Uh, April 20th, we're definitely a month into physical isolation for most people. Let me know, have your stay at home orders been renewed for your state, for your region? Is anybody preparing to go back to work in the United States? I know in Canada, we're on lockdown for quite a while still. Let us know what's new in the chat box what's going on where you are, anything you wanna share. I see a couple people typing. Um, so really excited to have Swim Angel Fish today. If you're not familiar with Swim Angel Fish, they have great free resources we'll be sharing uh, today. I will also give you guys a sneak peek, the show notes, uh, the ladies at Swim Angel Fish, Eileen and, um, forgive me, Cindy, they're doing a discount this week. So they'll be announcing that during their session, but they are doing 50% off this week on their online training for any of their paid swim whisperer programs. So that's a huge opportunity if you've ever considered taking their training. Um, it's, it's a really, really great training. So Katie Short in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada is saying the end of June for pools to reopen with big events canceled for July. So Canada Day, I've noticed a lot of places starting to cancel Canada Day, which is July 1st. I would expect there will be some places like New York that will probably cancel 4th of July. Um, so Ontario is a stay at home order until the end of May, but they are only announcing two to three weeks ahead of time. So it's, it's kind of a progressive. I see Christine in Las Vegas, Nevada, day 32 haven't been renewed yet, so until April 30th, but you're thinking May 15th, okay, that's fair. Um, I would imagine it is different in every person who comments on this in the chat. Catherine Cloutier is saying facilities are closed until the end of May, so Prince George County, Maryland. Catherine, from what I gather, Maryland's been hit pretty hard, and I understand that the, the language and the verbiage has been quite, not dramatic, but more forceful than some of the other um, kind of Delmarva areas. Um, Natalie is saying, we got approved for the PPP. If you can let us know what that is, I'm not sure what that is. Oh, maybe it's personal protective equipment. So I have to recall most of my staff back to work at home, trying to find online training and tasks they can complete from home, currently closed until May 18th, but could be longer. Uh, payroll protection plan, okay. so. Um, interesting that uh, it's, it's, it creates an unnecessary burden, not that it's avoidable, but it creates such a burden on the aquatic supervisor or the manager to come up with that training or those um, ways to keep staff busy, as it were. One of the good things I can tell you, uh, Natalie, is the Swim Angelfish does have five free webinars. So at a minimum, that could fill an hour and a half of your staff time. I will pop it in the chat box. We'll see it again later. I've also featured them on our Facebook page in the last day or two. But I want to scroll back. If you're just joining us, let us know where you're at in terms of is your stay at home order been renewed for your location, your state? Are you going back to work? What does that look like for our um, US participants? Kristen is saying our facility is closed. We are trying to conduct a soft open by May 10th until further information. Good to know. Um, we see 
Uh, Mike says it's his first day back at work. So congrats on that. I would imagine, Mike, every, is it everyone back at work? Is it upper management? Is it just selective people spaced out? What does that look like? Alana in Wisconsin is under a stay at home order until the last week of May. She saw on the news this morning, whoops, um, that representatives will be in state this week overseeing testing. So uh, Alana, any background for Wisconsin? I don't know the situation there too well. Is the CDC doing additional testing? Is there a new concern? So I know, for example, where I am in Southern Alberta, we had um, a situation on Friday, Thursday, where a meat plant south of us, very similar to, I believe, Iowa or South one of the Dakotas two weeks ago, we had a major outbreak with uh, several workers at the meat packing plant and then their family members who work at other locations also may be sick or also may be um, transmitting uh, unintentionally because of the, um, like they don't have any symptoms yet. So that's creating a major concern where I am in Alberta. Luis Torres from Castaic, California, LA County. So a date for May 15th, but not sure if that'll stand. Absolutely, that's still 25 days away. A lot could change. So Mike is saying the YMCA selective staff are back in the office to plan ahead. Makes sense to me. Uh, Christine saying hello to Madison. Uh, also originally, excuse me, from Wisconsin. Renee is saying we have the same meat plant here in Milwaukee, same story closed. Yes, so same as many meat packing plants, they offer great jobs for perhaps um, new immigrants or people with different levels of education, different life struggles. And unfortunately, meat packing plants, there's a lot of staff together, a lot of uh, working on a line, people are close together, residing cooperatively with families, extended family, home share, apartments. And so unfortunately, it's it's a very close density. Iowa, hi, Jill. Jill's here from Iowa. So major outbreak in the meat packing plants. Jill, I was thinking of you too with when our meeting on Thursday and the zones and how numbers were increasing in Iowa. Valerie is saying there's a stay at home in Arizona scheduled to expire on April 30th. No word yet on extending. There have been virtual meetings for managers uh, to keep staff informed. Not sure what the summer schedule looks like. So definitely, Valerie, I hear what you're saying, Arizona. I have several friends who reside in Arizona and just the bits and pieces that I'm seeing on Facebook. It's been interesting to follow as your temperatures ramp up. It's getting very hot in Arizona. People want to be outside and in a pool. So that's difficult. Welcome, I see Marilyn's here from Owed Sound. Alana said there was a huge spike last week in one specific area, not a lot of details being released. I hear you. Uh, Chris, Renee said she's in Greenfield, Wisconsin, near Milwaukee. Angela still has a stay at home order until further notice. Schools are closed until May 16th. That's hard. I mean, for people who have kids to be able to plan, to know what that looks like. I know back in, March, actually, Alberta, the province where I am in Western Canada, so north of uh, Montana, our premier went quite hardcore and said there was no school until further notice. So pretty immediately, most Albertans knew that they would have their kids at home until probably September. Typically, our school year starts after Labor Day. And so that's that's a long time for parents to be homeschooling and responsible for their children's education on top of everything else, family that they're caring for, um, you know, maybe lineups to go to the grocery store, working from home. It's a lot of stress for everyone. So welcome. If you're just joining us, let us know where you're from. It will be nice later for our presenters to see your location. Uh, Swim Angel Fish will be starting in about eight or nine minutes. So just let us know where you're from, what's new, are you still under a stay at home order? Has that been extended? Has that changed? We're not throwing rocks at any state or province, just curious to see what's going on for you and your work in aquatics. Okay, I'm just scrolling. So Ontario is still uh, out of school, no school until the end of May and then waiting to see for reopening. Wisconsin schools are closed till the end of this academic year. Nevada is the same. Hi, Natalie. Natalie from Aquatics Tribe, Alive Solutions is here from Southern California. Ashley's here from Austin, Texas. School year was canceled. 
developing five different opening plans, that's tough, right? So if we're thinking about that level of service, what is doable with the same budget? What is doable with less of a budget? What's doable with um, decreased level of service? So I know the Center for Disease Control last week was suggesting that swimming pools open at only 25% capacity, right? Bather load capacity, but nobody can seem to find that in writing. What does that mean? Is that, um, you know, do we allow lane swim where you have to pre-book a, a, a lane? Do we only allow 40 people into the pool at a time? They can only swim for an hour and then we make them leave. We re-sanitize everything and we invite more people back in. What does that look like? Right? Do we have to discontinue summer passes because we cannot have the same families coming in all the time? We want to have different clients coming in and paying admission to spread our limited use of the facility out. I don't know what that looks like. Jessica's here from Maryland. Christine is saying she may end up running programming for friends, kids this summer. Absolutely. I think that's fair. If you have, especially you have girlfriends or friends of the family and they're struggling with childcare, why not run programming in a small community? So for your family, friends, for your extended family, maybe a couple of colleagues, I think if that's a way to share the, the workload, that may be the way to go. The way some homeschooling co-ops, right, every parent might take a day. So maybe one parent takes Mondays, another parent takes Tuesdays, and that way the kids rotate through the small group. Linda's here from Mississauga. I see Lauren from Coppell, Texas. Kat's here from Statesboro Parks and Rec. Uh, Splash in the borough. We've got Finland. Welcome, Mina from Finland. So she's saying uh, all pools are closed. Homeschooling is happening. People are working from home until at least May 13th. Welcome. We This is our first person from Finland, so welcome. How did you find us? Let us know. Thank you for joining us. Cindy's here from New Brunswick. So schools are closed until the end of the school year, meaning they will reconvene in September. We are still under a state of emergency, only a few essential businesses open. That seems to be pretty standard in Canada right now. So grocery stores, um, uh, you know, gas stations, very limited. The gas station that we typically go to at the end of our street I went out yesterday to put air in my bicycle tires and the gas station was completely shut and blockaded off. They reported on the door that there was a staff member with COVID, um, uh, confirmed case of COVID on April 17th. So they were asking anybody who was there between April 3rd and 17th to self isolate. So that gas station is closed. Thankfully, I don't go very often. I don't think I was there after March 25th. So definitely a difficult situation. Welcome, if you're just joining us, let us know where you're from, what's going on. I see Stephanie from Charlotte, North Carolina. So school is out until May 18th. Melissa from Montrose, Colorado. Nicole is here from Michigan. Cindy from Sanford, North Carolina. So stay at home until the end of April. I think that's the end of the month. Brian is here from Sarasota, Florida. Lots of Florida this morning or afternoon where you are. Georgia has no school for the remainder of the year. Not sure the status of opening the aquatic center or water park, definitely difficult. Uh, Chris is here from Wisconsin, so safe at home until May 26th. Ben's here from Toronto, hi Ben. I was just, those of you that were here last week, I posted the show notes for Benjamin Zimmerman's session April 15th last week in the chat box. You can always scroll up in the chat box. We've also got uh, Marilyn's talking about one hour swims. I was saying earlier that I think we're going to have to limit swims. We're not going to be able to let those water babies or those kids that come and swim for hours, we're just not going to be able to let them stay on. We're gonna have to limit our swim time so we can bring in not more customers, but different customers. Arkansas schools are closed for the year. Several opening plans depending on the date you might reopen considering facility procedures. That's one thing, Kendra, that I have started in my email to my subscribers today that's going out. We're talking about what policies or procedures should you try and change now while the pools have been closed for six weeks, eight weeks. So things such as admission policies, safety and supervision policies. Do you have a within arms reach policy? Do you have a photography policy? Do you have a waiver or informed consent policy? 
I'm not suggesting we have a surplus of time right now to do these things, but these are those policies we've always wanted to implement. And we've been hesitant, or our managers and directors have been hesitant because of the impact. And yet most of our customers are going to remember pre-COVID pool. So if we want to make a change, now is the time to do that hard reset. Now is that time to reimagine something that we want to do differently because we can have the benefit of forgetting what was, I mean, at this point, do you remember what you were doing March 10th? Probably not because every day has felt so long. Ashley Munoz is here from Farmers Branch, Kristen from Newtown, Connecticut, Cheryl from Duluth, Minnesota, Kelly's here from Phoenix. So everyone, if you were here on Friday, Kelly did her session the session on foam and making in-service more realistic is also in the chat box. I will also go ahead and post the show notes for today. Vineland, New Jersey closed until at least May 15th, except non-essential. Ashley's here from Nanaimo, BC. Megan's here from Peoria, Peoria Arizona. Corey from Whitby. So welcome. Uh, we're going to get started in one or two minutes. I'm just scrolling through the chat box. I do see our presenters here, so let's give them a minute. I'm going to announce, uh, do my introduction before we start. So just get settled. If you need to use the washroom, grab a drink, please go ahead and do that now. I just want to scroll down. I see Bonnie from Corpus Christi. I'm just scrolling. Craig from Pennsylvania. Terrence from LA County. Corey from Whitby. Nick from Alexandria, Kimberly from Clarksville, Tennessee, another Katie from Oak, South Carolina, Aiko from St. Pete's Beach, Olivia from Stamford, Connecticut, Kieran from Wharton, Maryland, uh, Danelle and Claris home talking about 45 minute swims. Hi, Kim from Hawkesbury, St. Saval, uh, Jessica from Collinsville, lots of people here. Okay, so welcome, welcome. Let me go ahead and pin the show notes for today. That is going to have all of your information for today, including the PowerPoint that Cindy and Eileen have kindly shared. So let me go ahead and pin that in the chat box. Dana's here from Bonneville. Hello, Dana. Good to see that you're well. I hope you're well. Uh, let me post also the phone number, call in numbers before we get started. So if you can't hear me at any point or you can't hear one of our presenters, we do have different call in numbers. You can use a phone. So I'm going to post those in the chat box. Diane's here from Wainwright. See lots and lots of people. Welcome. Everybody's super excited for the opportunity to hear Swim Angelfish. And if you don't know about Swim Angelfish, you're going to know all about them by the end. So, excuse me. Oh, we've got another one from Finland. Hello. Welcome. We've got two from Finland today. So what I've done in the chat box, there's a Kansas City number. If you are in the US, you can use that number to call in on your phone. Uh, there's a Calgary number. If you're in Canada, then you will use the participant pin so that when we switch, if at any point you can't hear, that's going to be your call in option. Currently, the session is recording in the show notes. So that blue bar you'll see in the chat box, that is going to be where you can find the PowerPoint slides for today. And I also want to link to the YouTube videos the ladies will be talking about. Let me go ahead and put that playlist in the chat box so you can open those up in your browser. And then I'm going to do my introduction and I will introduce Aileen and Cindy. So thanks, everyone. Let me just click to a different slide. One moment. Okay. Oh my goodness, we're getting all kinds of people. We have Ali here from Saudi Arabia. Jeddah, welcome. So I'm going to do my introduction. So thank you so much, you guys, for joining us. It is Monday, April 20th. In uh, I am Katie Crysdale. I'm based near Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Thank you for joining us for these webinars. The out, um, sorry, the it's going to say outreach. The connectivity with everyone has been really amazing we have uh, people from all over the world now attending these webinars. what that shows to me is that during a period of uncertainty we are still the consummate pool person right we are still interested in learning we're still interested in connecting we're still worried about giving our staff the best that we can and we're still introduced we're still interested in investing in ourselves so thank you for spending an hour or an hour and a half with us today i think you're going to find a lot of value in today's presenters 
So today we have Swim Angelfish, and I want to give full credit to Paige from the Aquatalk podcast. I heard about the ladies from Swim Angelfish back in February. I was driving near Toronto, listening to Cindy on Paige's podcast. And Paige, I'll get you to put a link to your podcast and that episode in the chat box. But I have taught swimming lessons for 18 years, and Cindy was ta talking about why kids splash the water. And I just had this light bulb moment while I'm driving going, I've never thought about the why. I've always assumed the kids had a lot of energy. They were bored. I, I wasn't teaching well, or you know, they came home, they came to lessons from school, and they, you know, they were just rambunctious. And Cindy really made some points that to me were so so significant. And so I've asked them to present today, and I hope you find a lot of value learning about their adapted swim techniques but i really want you to understand that those techniques are not just for adapted individuals they really can be used as a tool kit for any of our swimmers whether adults or youth and they have lots of different strategies available on their website so i'm going to leave it there because i've been talking for a little while i'm going to authorize aileen and cindy's camera and I'll let them start chatting a little bit about how they got started, what they do, and then they'll share a little bit on a PowerPoint. I wanted to start out by just telling you all a little bit of our story. And I recognize a lot of the names in the chat of people that have been following us for a while. And I'm thanking you again for, for tuning in because as you know, um, we are constantly growing and changing and modifying as we learn as well. And I think you just keep learning with this kind of work until you stop doing this work, right? I'm sure you guys all agree. So Cynthia and I st met each other in 2000. So we're together now 20 years. And back when Cindy and I met each other, our real passion was therapy because I'm a physical therapist by training and Cindy's an occupational therapist. And it was just the two of us doing aquatic therapy in the water with kids with special needs. And when it came time for them to leave our program and pursue learning how to swim, we sent them back to the YMCA, to the JCCs, to Park and Rec, and back into the community. And parents were coming back to us saying, people don't know what to do with my child, and I wanna keep doing aquatic therapy because you guys seem to understand my child, even though our goal is learning how to swim. And we thought, well, that's crazy because these kids are ready to learn how to swim, and there's no reason why they can't be in a swim lesson with the goal being safety and independence in the water. So we started a journey by adding swim instruction to our program. And based on our therapy knowledge, we figured out why these children were having trouble learning to swim. Once we figured out the whys, we were able to teach other people the tips and the tricks to overcome the obstacles and also have successful swimming. So we created our Swim Whisperer Swim School in 2010, I believe. And basically, that's when we started offering swim lessons. So once we started offering swim lessons, it kind of exploded. And we started going to swim conferences and out into the swim world and really trying to educate others because the need is so great, we can't do it alone. I mean, the rates of autism are constantly increasing. It's one in 59 kids being diagnosed and drowning is the leading cause of death for these kids. So now it's, it's an epidemic and it's a harsh reality that everyone really needs to understand what to be doing in the water to get these kids feeling successful. And we're here to tell you that you don't have to wing it. You don't have to, you know, put the blame back on you. We want you to think kind of the same way Katie was thinking as to the whys. Why are these kids doing what they're doing? How can I help them and how can I achieve success? So fast forward to now, 2020, and we have four, four locations, uh, four states where we're doing our program. We have about 20 locations, and we started um, this online platform, the Swim Angelfish Online Certification. And we have reached other countries. We have reached, um, I saw somebody is on here from Saudi Arabia. We are we're in Dubai. We're doing some work with Qatar. We're kind of going international because our passion and our hard work and all the years that we've been doing this really have created this 
phenomenon of us being the global leaders in adaptive swim. And we're here to guide you to how to become a swim whisperer too and do this because these kids need you and these kids deserve more than someone that's just loving and patient. They deserve someone that has the specific training that they need to push them and to expect more from them and to get them independent. So today we're here to give you a taste of our program, to have you leave with some tips and strategies, and then to let you know what next steps are available. So thank you for pulling up the PowerPoint. Um, Cindy, are you able to speak at all? Yep, can you hear me? So I hear Cindy, and you guys hear Cindy. Yes, yes, yay, terrific. And Cindy is now let, not letting your voice go on here, sorry. Oh, that's what the echo was. Cindy was double, My fault. double recording me. Perfect. Well, today, these are the objectives that we would like to leave you all with, and we want to make sure you understand the foundation of our program, which is the 14 most commonly seen roadblocks in the acronym of Swim Whispers, that's swimmers with autism, sensory issues, motor difficulties, anxiety, trauma, delay, are having when they're learning to swim. How many of you just do regular swim lessons and come across obstacles, come across the ch child that doesn't like to go on their back, come across the child that's fearful when their feet leave the ground? I think we see these obstacles with many kids. So like Katie said, although our program is specifically designed for the special needs community, our strategies are going to impact all of your lessons. The, I'll, I'll go through all the objectives and then I'll just let Cindy um, talk. The other program that is encompassed in our online learning is called Adapted Swim Angels. And that acronym really deals with the assessment and the discovery and the figuring out what to do with the children that are more physically impaired, but also for our sensory kids as well. You know, keep in mind when something doesn't work, I consider it still my assessment, right? And when you come up with the right strategies that work for your swimmer, then you're on to the, really the success. So we're going to show you how to integrate all of this into your swim curriculum. And that's the beauty of it all. We're not here to teach a swim curriculum. We're here to make your swim curriculum better because we want to arm you with the tools that you need to overcome roadblocks and then go back to teaching swimming. So I, I guess can if everybody can hear me, which I hope you can. So I, I'm looking at some very cool comments. I see somebody is saying, um, I guess it is um, Susan Hill is saying she works with deaf and blind students. And then somebody else is commenting, I think her name is Cindy Green, that she has some training and certification with Autism Swim out of Australia. And the beautiful thing about the Swim Whispers program is that it, it seamlessly integrates into strengthening whatever way you guys are all teaching, whether it's typical kids or special needs kids or anxious adults. And so our message is any training is amazing and please don't wing it. Um, we, we would ask that you, and you'll see on here, we have two and a half hours of absolutely free information that anybody can use for some training. And our overall goal is to accept all abilities into your program and realize that there are some underlying reasons for things that you can do in your program to teach faster with less discomfort. And we're just opening and congratulating everybody who's bringing somebody with ABA to the pool or bringing somebody who has special ed experience or doing some training that's specific to a certain diagnosis and, and acknowledging in the aquatic community that, um, and I think Aileen will agree with me, that specialty training is necessary. And sometimes when you, we go to things, they'll say things like, well, you just need patience and you just need to have some special ideas and be engaging. But the, the real passion for us being OT and PT team is that we kind of identify these underlying problems and we, we sort of were able to put it into a program that you could weave in and out of your swim skill benchmarks use some of our strategies within whatever your swim curriculum is, and then hopefully reach your swim skill benchmarks a little faster than you typically would. So this, this guide is for you to see that our program is made 
for any ability. And a lot of times, I'll just give a quick example. If if you think of picture schedules, sometimes we think of that as, oh, somebody with nonverbal autism might need that or somebody that's using a wheelchair that has limited language. But have you ever tried using some pictures or a visual schedule of some equipment in an order with a typical swimmer who's just anxious? It can really be life changing. So our, our asking you to like color outside the lines, think outside the box of whether you whether you um, decide to listen to our two and a half hours of free information on our webinars or you choose to add becoming a swim whisperer to strengthen your curriculum, really looking at all these possibilities that after maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 years of teaching, you have your way of doing it and it works, but possibly there's some flexibility to teach outside of the way that you are currently teaching. So this chart just kind of shows that you, what, whatever your swim goal is or your level is, and then you would identify a roadblock or an area of focus Maybe you're going to add some strategies and techniques that are something you're not typically used to doing. One of the things we talk about, and I know some of our instructors are on the phone, but we think about taking kids underwater moving forward a lot of times. But sometimes kids with sensory issues or motor issues benefit from just walking backwards or moving backwards to go under because it helps them to flex their body and tuck their chin. So we just want to go through, give you one quick tip for each of the roadblocks. And, and then if you like it, you can go on and then watch 25 minutes of a webinar. But this is our honor to be here today. And we're so appreciative. And we just want to give you some strategies and techniques to use in your very next lesson. So this is kind of, I guess Aileen will just take turns back and forth. This is what we've identified as the 14 roadblocks. And you'll see if you watch any of our webinars, we love acronyms. So every, every webinar has the name of the, the webinar, for example, lifeguarding, and it will give you lifeguarding and it will give you categories for all of the words. And then it gives you strategies and techniques. For example, that webinar that's free complements anybody's lifeguard training and it's called soft signs to approach differently. What we're talking about here is the 14 roadblocks in swimming. That webinar is called Swim Tips, and you can get 14 strategies and techniques that aren't in the training from that. And this is sort of the way that Aileen and I organize our thoughts when it comes to special needs adaptive swim training. Yeah. So basically, we're, we're going to go through each of these so we can move to the next slide. And um, you're going to see a series of pictures here that you can't click on because they're videos. But I want you all to know that if you go to our YouTube channel and you just click in Swim Angelfish Video, you can see all of these videos. We pulled them from our YouTube channel. And there's little examples of all of these different techniques, strategies, safety. So the first one that we want to talk about, of course, is safety. And safety is a big one. And especially for the kids that we're walking, that we're working with, they're runners, they're bolters, especially the kids on the spectrum. So encouraging a safe ritual and routine at the start of every lesson is something that we always do. One of the helpful things that we suggest is making sure the child goes from their parent to the instructor and that there's some sort of dialogue of asking for permission, even if they're nonverbal, they know to wait until the instructor gives them the sign to get in the water. So it's always wait and ask to get in. And that's what Cindy's discussing right here with her client in, the, in this picture. If you click on that video online, you'll see a lot of um, behaviors of this particular nonverbal boy. So if you are embracing some swimmers, in this case with autism into your program, and some of the instructors are a little bit nervous, if you go on our YouTube channel, they'll be able to actually see what some of some of the things look like. I think this is a, a two to three minute video that you can access and it will just help your staff or your team that might be a little bit nervous about bringing some of the kids into the program to see what it might what it might look like for them. I'm not sure what the next slide is, but how many of you in the program have uh, a rescue tube that you make sure your typical swimmers are familiar with what it is. This is like triple important. 
when you have special needs adaptive swimmers, uh, whatever ability they are, irregardless of whatever their diagnosis is, really take a, a, a minute to think about ways that you can incorporate them to become familiar with a rescue tube, whether it's touching it, whether it's swimming with it, but it's a really good way that we hopefully can have more successful saves in the unlikely event that somebody does fall into a, a pool or a river or a lake or a pond that they actually have some visual or maybe even they had experience of holding it. So think about incorporating that rescue tube in some way, shape or form into uh, some of your special needs adaptive swim lessons. Since that would be a, a great strategy and technique to make sure to do. I'm just going to add one more tip to safety because it's such a huge one. I know we said we're only going to give one tip, but the other thing about safety is, is that we want to also build a ritual and routine about getting in the water. So sometimes before a child gets in, we'll do some sort of, sort of quick, Simon says, lift your hands. Simon says, touch your knees. Simon says, clap your hands. Simon says, sit down. And now Simon says, get in the water. And we do that for a number of reasons. Some of these kids are in this fight and flight state where they're just in this impulsive running cycle where we can't get them to stop. They just want the satisfaction of jumping in the water. By stopping this cycle and doing a quick rote Simon says activity, which is very much like ABA, if you think about it, that's applied behavior analysis, you know, hands, you know, hands up hands down, do this, do that. It breaks the sequence and it breaks it and it gives that parent a few extra minutes if they were in a dangerous situation to be able to intervene. And this has really worked for us in the past. Not only do the kids like it, but we've been told that we've had clients where a parent was on vacation and Cindy, you can jump in if I'm wrong, where the mom, the, the child did get away and she did find them in the hotel pool and they were doing a couple of Simon Says activities, jumping in, doing a ritual and routine, climbing back out based on the structure of what their swim lesson is. So these ritual and routines for safety are really important. So I, I'm just um, communicating with Crystal that she um, wasn't able to move the slide. So I moved the slide. And I know that this is the, the topic that many of you probably have tried before. When you get to properties of the water, one thing that becomes very scary for a lot of special needs swimmers is that they don't understand the buoyancy, right? So we're all sitting, we feel grounded. So a super simple strategy is to add weight. And how do you add weight? We all know being in aquatics that we add, we can add a long sleeve cotton shirt and I know we have limited time on this webinar. We want to get through everything. But I had a boy who swam for 15 times with a, a franchise of a swim school that has a little bit of training in special needs. And, and when he came in, just taking a minute to assess, wow, it really sounds like he just doesn't know where his body is. In, in one visit with a long sleeve, heavy cotton shirt, by the end of 15 minutes, I was able to take the shirt off. He was smiling and walking and mom was literally tearful at the edge of the pool. And all of us, that's a free strategy. It's in our training. That, that's a really good thing to try with any swimmer that has unreasonable anxiety for somebody who just, you, you just discover that it just looks like something is really bothering them with being in this environment. And a, a lot of the times, and I think our staff that's on the phone call would agree, a lot of times it's figuring out a way to weight down their body and a long sleeve shirt, long sleeve pants, sometimes socks. And, and we know that there's 7,000 nerve endings in the bottom of your feet, like sometimes getting your feet even grounded. Um, but this is a great strategy or technique that you guys could walk away from this webinar with. And Aileen, I'm gonna click it to the next slide so you can just I let can, me know I if, if I should slow I down or speed up. Well. I can click it too. I see. So the next um, roadblock that we're gonna talk about is I can't touch that. How many of you have the swimmers that number one, won't touch equipment. They won't hold the equipment. Everything just like melts right out of their hands. They won't even exude force in their hands to hold something or they don't even want to be touched by you. They just want 
to be alone doing their own thing. This is a common roadblock and the tip that we want to give you about that is to respond and not react. So if somebody doesn't want to be touched and they push away and they get alarming, you don't want to just respond to that. You uh, react to that. You want to respond to it. You want to think why are they doing this? How can I guide them with my body? Sometimes it's you kind of corralling them with your body to get to the side and hold on. Or it's you holding on with them to the barbell and maybe giving them a spin as they do it so that it's really fun and meaningful. And it's you persisting on trying it again, trying it again, and not letting them get away from you that actually achieves the success. So we want them to be able to take side for many reasons. We want them to be hold, hold equipment for many reasons. Why would that be? How can you possibly have a successful save with somebody when you're thinking about the drowning statistic if they won't even hold on to something? We always do reach, throw before you go. So we want to make sure these kids are okay holding equipment and can help themselves. A lot of times they get into the deep water and they're not aware of the consequence. Sometimes we let them feel that consequence of doing a quick dunk under and holding the equipment right in front of them. You might get them to grab on then when they feel the consequence and start building that successful loop of I need to hold on to hold myself up so that I can get back to the shallow. So I, I, I love how you explained that, Aileen, and I can't touch that. Definitely, uh, we've done a couple of NDPA webinars that everybody can access and we talked about the three most commonly seen universal roadblocks that directly relate to drowning prevention. And, and what those are is making a child go under, I can't touch that, and safety. So I, I feel like those are three of our roadblocks that really can speak loudly to all of you of what you're doing with your special needs adaptive swimmers. And um, the, the video right before that is a video that you can see on YouTube when you go in and it's an extra strategy on how you get goggles on somebody that doesn't want to be touched. So I hope you go on the YouTube channel because it's a great video of putting on goggles. Um, this one, making a child go under successfully. Now, you guys are all expert instructors and you probably have a million different ways to take kids underwater. Um, a lot of times kids are familiar with body parts so you can use the body parts as a method and a strategy to go under. Lips in, ear in, nose in, eyes in, and then all the way under. Some of our students and some of your special needs students, especially if they just have some coordination issues, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, some of these kind of things, it really is powerful, like we talked about before, not to go under forward. Aileen and I have found some, some of our students have what we call primitive reflexes that aren't integrated yet. And what happens is when something startles them or when they get in a, a certain movement position, this is what they tend to do. When, when you go underwater with your head up and everything goes up your nose, it can be very uncomfortable. Taking that swimmer and moving backwards what does the viscosity of the water do? What does the turbulence do? If it's all behind me, moving me, it's going to push me more into a ball. Sometimes it's more comfortable for some kids to just walk backward and impose going under by themselves. Some kids moving backwards, holding under their arm will push them into just a little bit of flexion. Flexion is calm. Calming, like when you're sitting on a swing, you're you're calm and you're moving backwards. So it just might be a nice thing to, to play around with a strategy or a technique of thinking about going under in a little bit of a ball, going under while you're moving so the water pushes you like this, and then also body parts and maybe even practicing at home in, in the bathtub. I just wanted to jump in there, Cindy, and say the reason the bathtub practice is so successful is because the child is grounded. A lot of times if you feel, fill the bath only with a little bit of water and they're laying on their stomach, they feel where their body is, they might be a little bit more willing to do what's so scary to them and that's putting their face under. So think about that in your pool. Are they panicking going under because they can't feel where their body is? Are you in the deep water? Are they feeling you know, the effects of buoyancy all over their body? 
why don't you try maybe introducing it at the steps where they can be sitting, where they have control of the rest of their body so they only have to focus on that one skill. Sometimes that helps a lot too. This that's, is a, that's a really it, good point with going underwater. And I think probably all of you are going to be in the situation. And I know Tessa, who is listening, we, we had a, a swimmer who the adverse response of just even the thought of going underwater, we tried all 10 of our different techniques and strategies in our program and they weren't working. And, and believe it or not, we, we expressed to the parents, we cannot not go under. We explain why we need to work on going under. We try everything. He's still upset. And Tessa was able to make some kind of a game. I turned him around. I looked at mom. I said, let's just come up in the air and see what happens if he goes under. And, and we were able to break all the rules, think outside the box, threw him up in the air. He landed. He went under. He came up and he laughed and he said, I don't want to go under. I'm not going under. But he loved going under. And that became eventually the way that he went underwater. So use your techniques they know and be open-minded with the parents to any other kind of techniques. But please, please don't not address going under because we have been in situations where kids have been in lessons, believe it or not, a year or two, and they were so panicked about going under that the instructors and the parents just agreed that they wouldn't they wouldn't practice that skill. And, and we don't live in the parents' shoes of you know, the, the anxiety of they get in the parking lot, they don't want to come in the door and they don't even want to come swimming anymore. So making a child go underwater successfully or a swimmer, super important, be flexible and, and definitely try to work through that. Aileen, you want to do what did I say? Yep. I just wanted to say, this is why it's called a toolbox of strategies, right? You have to follow your intuitive instinct and some sometimes certain things don't work and it's nice to have a lot of options to just you know, constantly be flexible and adaptable and trying them. So I'm going to talk about what did I say? And what did I say isn't supposed to sound like what did I say? Like attitude -y, but it's more about what did you hear <laughs> me say? The kids that have an auditory processing problem. Some of these kids cannot filter out background noise. And um, I actually did a game with a bunch of teenagers that wanted to volunteer with kids with special needs. And I wanted them to feel what it feels like when you have trouble with auditory processing. So just bear with me for a minute. The game that I played, which you might want to do with your staff, is I had a room of like 40 kids. One of them, they were in groups of four. One of them was the child with auditory processing. The other three, one of them was the swim instructor giving them directions. The other two had to do annoying auditory activities the whole time. So one of them was tapping them constantly on their on their head and singing a song, while the other one was giving them directions of something else to do, while the third person that was the swim instructor was giving them a direction of, I need you to write down these three words. And they were trying to process all of that while they were feeling all of these things on their body. Now that's an extreme example, but basically at the end of that activity, everyone said to me, I couldn't believe how difficult it was for me to hear what the person was saying. There was so much going on and my body just felt so annoyed. So auditory processing difficulties, sometimes we are not as sensitive to the acoustics in the pool. The other swimmers, maybe one particularly loud swim coach that has a certain volume of a voice that's bothering everyone else. And we're saying our directions and this one swimmer is just getting lost. The key to remember is to be very rhythmical, use a few words, and don't keep repeating the directions because you can almost think of it as a reset in the head. Every time you're repeating, it's like the wheel starts all over again. So you use few words, you don't repeat too often, and you pause. Pause between directions. And the last tip that you could add is you can add some kind of touch as you're giving the directions to make sure they're connected to you and not to everything else that's going on in the environment. Do you want to add anything to that, Cindy? No. So okay. I, I want to mention also, I hope that you can all hear me, but I, I wanted to also mention 
that when I took all ability swimming with the United States Swim School, they have a, a basic six hour class that you can take as, as good and basic information. And they actually did that activity. And it was really powerful for the instructors to do that. So I, I, I encourage you to do that. And it really relates to all communication. So it'd be a nice thing to be able to do. Um, I, I'm not going on my back. How many of you guys have, have seen that with typical kids? And how do you address it or, or adults? And, and when we get to the special needs adaptive swim, somebody with a physical disability, somebody who has some motor coordination, uh, all of us run across our different ways of giving comfort and giving support and then grading the support away. And one thing that you might not be comfortable doing, but you might give a try is to provide an opportunity for them to Im impose putting their head back while they're in a flexed position. For, for example, how many of you guys um, go on the wall and you're on the wall like Spider-Man or you say wall ball or a blast off position? Sometimes that position when you're grounded and you're holding would allow the swimmer to move their head back and, and forth or even side to side and, and recognize that in the water with that stability, they can impose it upon themselves. Many times our, our swimmers that we see, they, they really don't even know how to move their head back and forth. And it gives you just a great idea of, wow, look up and they're doing this. And you're saying, okay, put your head back. And they just put it a tiny bit. So teaching them either with a tiny bit of support or if they're nervous and they don't want you near them, having them do it on their own, either sitting on the step or in a wall ball, helping them to figure it out where they can move their head. And the tip really, when they go on their back, is to be okay and allow them in the beginning to go underwater with their head a little bit flexed. If, if you can allow them to do it with their head flexed, you're going to avoid any complications of back float that might come from a startle reflex. If you, some of our kids, or maybe guys, when you're sitting in a chair and you move back and it startles you, if they get nervous or afraid and the startle comes, their head will go back and we don't want that to happen. So allow a back float is your strategy and, and technique. See what they do with their head moving back and forth first. Notice if they're so nervous to put it back and then allow because of some underlying reasons that we're not going to go into today, but allow the back float with your chin a little bit flexed because it will give them a little bit of comfort and then either having them impose it upon themselves or you assisting imposing it on them. Aileen, do you have anything to add to that? No, but I am going to backtrack, Cindy, to um, how do I control my body and my breath? which was right before this, just so the group knows it's so hard because the pictures are so little on my screen. I have my glasses on, so I'm sorry I skipped this H. And um, it was the one that's right before what Cindy just spoke about. So I'd like to quickly address it. And it's how do I control my body and my breath? Because some of these kids are so used to gravity. Have you noticed how children with autism, some of them or sensory issues, might walk on their toes or might flick their hands with flapping. They're doing this for joint feedback. And where do you get a lot of joint feedback but in gravity? Well, go into the pool and gravity is taken away and you have no idea where your body is. So sometimes a lot of our anxious swimmers are anxious because they can't figure out how to control their body. And when you can't figure out how to control your body, how do you breathe? It's that shallow, fast, upper chest breathing. So spending a few minutes on this roadblock by going from sit to stand at the steps and coordinating the feeling of buoyancy. When I'm deeper, I'm more buoyant. When I stand up, there's less buoyancy. And connecting it with breath. When I sit down, I exhale and blow bubbles. When I stand up, I take a big inhale and really slowing things down before you then move to actually being in a position to swim is very helpful for this roadblock. So then moving from there, I think this is a great spot to talk about seeking sensory input and breath holding. How many, how many of you guys have ever seen 
maybe a swimmer with Rett syndrome that they do some breath holding as part of their um, condition, it, it can be a little bit nerve wracking in the pool. And, and how many of you have has seen some, some swimmers that seek sensory input and they would rather stay on the bottom at three feet or stay on the bottom at five feet or stay on the bottom at seven feet with disregard for coming up for a breath. And so seeking sensory input and controlling breath is something that we're going to see with a lot of swimmers and, and adults. And so when we're talking about seeking sensory input as a roadblock, we're looking at what they're doing and trying to look at it with a different brain instead of just the swim skill benchmarks you're trying to meet. So if you if you stay with me for a minute, meaning they're seeking sensory input. And my lesson plan is I want to teach elementary backstroke and they keep seeking sensory input. Instead of working on your swim skill benchmark that you have in mind, we're asking for the flexibility in your lesson plan to seek sensory input either by going under and allowing some deep water bobs in three feet or five feet or seven feet, allowing three or four jumps into the pool because that is how they seek sensory input. Breaking that surface tension and jumping in the pool feels so good to their body that they just want to do that instead of listening to you. They just want to go under deep and feel that deep pressure as you go under. So allow flexibility in your plan to be like, okay, they are not listening. They're seeking. And how many people have seen this with kids with ADHD in general? How many of you as instructors love to go sit on the bottom and never really knew why? Well, the deeper you go, the more pressure there is. So when you see these seeking behaviors, think about there's no set recipe. Think about changing your whole plan and moving from that day's lesson that maybe you had elementary backstroke or breaststroke and thinking, wow, they're really seeking sensory input. Maybe I should work on back crawl or front crawl. Why? Because they slap the water and they're going to like that. They're going to like that input and they could work on front crawl or back crawl. If you wanna keep with your lesson of elementary backstroke or breaststroke, maybe you allow a little sensory break. We're going to jump in three times, we're gonna get a dive toy off the bottom three times, and then we're gonna work on our stroke. Instead of always trying to get rid of the sensory input, see if you could satiate it a little bit so that then you can teach the swim skills that you're going for. Aileen, do you have um, any other things you wanna say about that? Yeah, I want to. It's a huge roadblock. And I also want to tell you the child that's sitting in a wheelchair, that's rocking in their wheelchair, when they get in the water, they don't want to just do this slow, you know, prop around with equipment and kick in the pool. They want the sensory input too. So acknowledge that. Children show you what they need. And when they come in and they're showing you something they need, whether it's going to the bottom, whether it's this back and forth motion. Give, the, give it to them, satiate it, so that then what they do is they can then regulate. Their body is calmer. They can regulate and focus on the skill you need to teach. I, I love that. And some sometimes the sati they'll seek for the entire lesson. We have a client that swims on Sunday who swims, breaking the surface tension on and on and on and on. And, and the parent actually asked me, Kristen, this is one of your clients, the parent said to me, Cindy, when is my son going to stop splashing on top of the water? And, and I said, well, probably not. And he said, well, why? And I was able to tell him to watch the parent education webinar, which is another free webinar we have that explains to the parents why they're seeing some of these behaviors. Now, sometimes somebody will stop seeking the water, whether it's drinking or splashing, and you can teach a skill for two or three minutes. And then you have to go back to giving them some, sometimes not. Sometimes you could maybe give three sensory breaks during a swim lesson and go back to teaching your swim skill. And sometimes you might have to give some kind of input every two to three minutes, depending on what the, what the swimmer presents like. Um, Aileen, do you want to do problems with letting go of, of the edge? 
Yeah. I mean, how many of you see those swimmers that are clutched to the side and they won't let go? I actually had this very intense experience with a boy that came to see me from Washington and his mom said, we want to do a one week intensive and I wanted to leave with him swimming. And I said, well, what can he currently do? And she said, well, he just hangs on to the side of the pool, but he's basically a typical boy. Um, I homeschool him. He has some coordination issues, but, and then I'm thinking, okay, he's 12 years old and he won't let go of the side of the pool. There's more to it here. So what I did is I spent, I had five days with him. And what I did is I spent time teaching him what was stable, what was stable, what was not stable. How do I control my body? How do I not control my body? And really having him play around with this and, and you start with a lot of stability and then you start taking it away so that by the end he could swim. You don't get to swimming by just practicing swimming. That's why I feel like these roadblocks are so important. If you address the reason behind why they're having an issue, you're gonna su achieve success quicker. And in this case, this little boy right here in this picture, he is very fearful of laying on his back, won't let go of the side. We did have him laying on our shoulder. We did have him laying across our chest. We did have him with total support of another person, but we couldn't transition him from that to just feeling it himself. But by moving to this piece of equipment in particular, it's called the, um, I believe it's called the torpedo um, or swim trainer. Some companies call it a swim trainer, some call it a torpedo, but it has this mesh netting and it was made for kids to lay on their stomach. But because he felt the support on his back, then he was able to hold on to something with his hands and his head felt the pressure of where he was in space, he was a lot more willing to stay in an aligned good position on his back. And we were then able to grade it to just dumbbells in his hands. And he practiced tipping back to then just a noodle under his back to then nothing. So remember to grade things and move in a progression. Just because somebody does well laying on your back, you can't then just go to nothing. Okay, I, I, I was kicked off for that, but I'm sure you slayed it and you said a lot of great information, but I'm, I'm back in now. Um, engagement and interaction, I think all of us use a lot of gestures and all of us understand that we have to really engage our, our swimmers. The three things that the strategies for, for this is novelty, sometimes even bringing a different color ball into the pool or a different reward, something like that. And intuition, the intuition that you have, if, if you're swimming with a swimmer and you think that they're pointing to something else that they want and they they something just doesn't seem right, I think that we, we always like to say the kids will show you what they need or show you what they want. And, and be open to following your intuitive gut sense. Sometimes it's, you know what, today is the day we're going underwater or Wow, this is going so great today. I'm going to I'm going to push this a little bit farther and go for a flip turn. So following your intuition and then and then flexibility. Flexibility, engagement and interaction not only with your student but also with the parents. You can get some great information on new rewards, new reinforcers, maybe some some information about that they spent more time out of their wheelchair that day and that was a day that they did so much better in the water and figuring out how always to interact and get more information about your swimmer so that you can understand if you had a great lesson if there was something else also going on that helped you do you have aileen anything you want to say about engagement and interaction yeah it's it's really a gift and it's a dance okay you want to you want to be so engaging that somebody wants to be with you you don't want to be that instructor that's like forcing someone to want to listen to you you don't want to be that instructor that's conducting the lesson the whole time saying all right if you don't listen to me you're going to sit out you know you want to be that instructor that is so engaging and fun that you're like the pied piper and everyone's following along and i think one other point to mention of how to do that is joining the child where they're at and making it a back and forth interaction and following their lead and trying to again you think of it as as drawing them in to wanting to do what you want to do and a, a quick example of that was, was when cindy had a behavior with someone that just kept flicking water he would throw the water up and then flick it throw it up and flick it finally she's like do it one more time and you're sitting out 
And then I'm like, Cindy, do it with him for a minute and just see what happens. So she's like, I hate this so much. I'm going to do it with him. But the activity was like aversive to her. So she starts doing it with him. And then she's like, oh God, he starts laughing. He starts thinking to himself, like she gets it. This is fun. Next thing you know, she turns it into, now we're going to smack the water, smack the water. Next thing you know, it's turning into front curl arms across the pool. And it was because he wanted to do it because she lured him in and he, he connected <laughs> with her and he wanted to do it. And sometimes it's just not in your comfort zone or your personality, but keep it in your toolbox because it works. All right. I, 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 wanna, <laughs> I just want to say I maybe was a little nicer. However, I, I don't know how many of you instructors out there are. You have your own personality of the way that you're going to get things done. And over the past 21 years, and, and especially I'll never forget that day, because you ever have something that just bugs you about something about the water? Well, I don't like it when somebody smacks it and it goes right into my face, even after all these years. And and you ever have a, like a team member or a coworker that, that knows you so well and always wants what's best for you? So literally just looked at me and said, you're doing it wrong. Join him in his space and do what he's doing. And you're going to have amazing success. And that was, I think, 15 years ago. And I have used that strategy again and again and again, because I don't know about all of you, but sometimes when you you go in and you're used to something that you do with your swimmer, you're, you're not really open, even though you think you might be open to switching the way that you're you're going to interact. And she calls it like joining them in their space. Sometimes I see it as a little waste of time, but it wasn't. It was joining them in their space. And, and it just brings up such a great point for all of our swim whispers and especially everybody on the call that is part of Swim Angelfish family. We have to oftentimes work out of anything that's familiar to us because we have a student who has a physical disability and we don't know what's going to happen to their body in the water or we have somebody with a different kind of behavior and we haven't handled it before. So being able to be open and work outside of your own comfort zone of your teaching style is another huge, huge important thing to remember when you're embarking on special needs adaptive swim. I just want to add the picture um, there. Didn't I'm really going to go to excessive it. drinking. How many know. of you guys out there Cindy? have uh, swimmers? Cindy? Oops. Can you, I just want to say something. Um, I saw that there was a question about what's being worked on in this picture. And I just wanted to let you guys know, um, this all looks like it's easy and fun. But what I want you to know is these two boys were basically, I don't even know how to say this in a nice therapy way. They were off the walls. Nobody was listening to me. It was chaos in the pool. They were splashing in like tsunamis, cannonballing. I had lost control. So engagement and interaction pulled it together. I had them climb out. I had them face to face with me and I got them to engage with me again and not do their own thing in the water. And then I was able to move back into it. And that's why we put it into engagement and interaction. When you're in a group and everyone's going in different directions, you've got to think of a way to corral everybody to get that engagement and that control back. That's what was happening there. I, I, um, I just want to piggyback on that. Some people are asking where we're located. And so I just want you to know that we have 20 locations in New England. So we're in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and New York. And we have about 40 instructors. We do occupational and physical therapy, and we do swim whisper swim lessons. Um, we also, in addition to only seeing kids or adults with special needs, whether it's autism, physical disabilities, sensory motor. We also have an online training platform if you wanna become a swim whisperer and, and strengthen your existing curriculum with the strategies and techniques that are in the toolbox of swim whispers. But a Aileen and I, with all these locations here, have a great feedback loop of not only our staff, but also our users, we have about 400 Swim Whispers worldwide. And it just relays greatly, thank you for that question, to this roadblock. So excessive drinking is a big problem for a lot of people. Um, one of the things that one of our users out in California, he works for Swimscape and he said, Cindy, I've tried every 
strategy and technique in your program for excessive drinking and none of it has worked. And he called me one day and said, you're never going to believe I got Ivan to swim without drinking. And I said, how did you do it? And he said he added a mouth guard. So this boy loves the water. He's nonverbal, loves swimming, but he drank so much water that it got dangerous and he couldn't keep him only on his back. And none of our strategies were working for him. He was able to let us know, hey, anybody having trouble with excessive drinking and strategies aren't working, try a mouth guard. And that makes so much sense from our background as therapists because your mouth has 7,000 nerve endings. When you bite on something, it releases serotonin. How, how many of you like to chew on ice or like crunchy food or you have much more organized when you're chewing a couple pieces of gum? So there's a lot of underlying reasons why the swimmers drink excessively or swirl the water and spit it around, which you can learn in our online training, the science behind it. But this mouth guard is a great free strategy or technique and it makes a lot of sense to provide the bite around the entire mouth and when you bite can you really like drink water while you're biting i mean maybe a little bit but it's very tricky um and then kristen who is one of our swim whispers had a client max and she invented uh, a new thing the mom said he loves to suck on ice chips they went to the the ice machine and sure enough the ice gave enough input to his mouth that he began to suck and keep his mouth closed. And every five or six minutes or so, he would just suck on a piece of ice. And it allowed her to pursue her lesson with less drinking of the water and more productive swimming. And sometimes things with excessive drinking in your mouth and biting an extra tip, it can also help with self-regulation. And anybody listening, you could think about what do you do with oral motor things or things in your mouth? Do you, do any of you chew two pieces of gum or three pieces of gum? Or do any of you like to suck on certain lifesavers or things while you're working? There's a lot of powerful things in your mouth that help many things in your body. But the two free strategies and techniques that we're offering for you guys today are ice, ice chips and a mouth guard. So I know where I just want to be respectful. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. And I know where we're at two o'clock. So, I mean, the, we're just going to go and just finish up Swim Whispers because we only have two, two or three more slides. And then we just want to be able to give a couple minutes of questions. So we're just going to move a little quicker through these. But just know that um, we do have the five free webinars. And the webinar on Swim Tips has this more in detail. So if you guys wanted a little more than we're able to give on this on this slide. Um, ritual and routine is super important. We all rely on it, we all thrive on it, and we do lots of things for ritual and routine. We use a picture schedule, we use it as a social story, we actually use it not only for our swimmers that are nonverbal, but how about the swimmers that like to have control or get a little anxious we set out the pictures of everything we want to accomplish in a lesson, and then we have them maybe pick the order of it. So it's a very powerful tool to have that visual support. It really cuts down on anxiety tremendously. So a, a lot of times we could even do it with a waterproof iPad case too. If, if you guys are interested in that waterproof iPad case idea, there's an app that we use called Good Karma Apps, and it's the first then visual schedule app and we put it on an iPad, get a waterproof case, and then we're able to do it that way as well. And we're gonna bring it on home with success with swim strokes, which is our last um, roadblock. And that's really, that's really the, the measure of success, right? Are we getting the kids to swim and be independent in the pool? And we never limit our kids. We always believe that everyone has the ability to swim. And we have a swim team in Greenwich where our, our swim coach, Joe, is working on butterfly drills, on flip turns. I mean, these kids are doing amazing. And it's just important to understand why certain swim strokes will be easier than others. Are they requiring a lot of coordination or are they a swim stroke like breaststroke where both sides of the body do things at the same time? Start to think about the whys and don't be very rigid in starting always with freestyle, you know, and then moving from there to backstroke. Like maybe it's okay if a child has very good symmetrical mo motion to start with butterfly or breaststroke. 
So start to think about the whys, start to address some of these underlying problems, and I think you're gonna start seeing a lot of success too. So I, I think um, success with swim strokes, two of the things that you could take home for strategies and techniques, one is when a swimmer that has some kind of physical disability or some kind of sensory um, difficulty, they might use their vision. So picking a stroke like breaststroke where they can actually see where their body is might be easier for them. And then what Aileen was talking about is front crawl and back crawl are asymmetrical and your body's doing different things. So it would seem to us that that's a, a harder thing to motor plan. But a lot of times, those are the strokes that provide that sensory input. And we teach how to pull with power. And we allow those strokes because those strokes give the sensory. When in reality, the symmetrical strokes, like where you're doing something the same on both sides, sculling, breaststroke, elementary backstroke, for special needs population would be easier motor planning. And um, we, we want you to never, ever obviously limit with special needs with the swimming. I mean, we have seen kids doing IMs that in the beginning were just jumping and swimming around or they were in their wheelchair, unable to be independent. Um, we're just gonna go through these other slides real quick. Adapted Swim Angels is part of Swim Whispers and it all integrates into each other. And there's a lot of videos on our Swim Angel Fish YouTube channel that geared towards people with physical disabilities. And I believe you do also get um, this PowerPoint as part of this presentation, I think. But we have so many of these resources available in Swim Angel Fish YouTube channel. This is Emily. She has spastic um, quadriplegia. And she is now able to get in the water, do rollovers, swim by herself, and, and, and have complete independence aside from transferring to the to the lift at the pool. So you really, what you're doing is life changing. And if you're interested in some testimonials on our, on our YouTube channel, you'll see them. Aileen and I have free webinars and the free webinars are there for you guys to share. So please, please share the information and, and know that after our 20 years of being together, one of our overall goals is to provide this kind of education. So the free resources, lifeguarding, soft signs to approach differently, please, please share it and have your lifeguards complement their information. Uh, the equipment webinar where you can find things. The special needs adaptive swim, you know, the parents want to know what's going on. And this is such a powerful thing for them to just listen to. Why is my swim swimmer and why is my child doing some of these? And this could actually be life changing. We, we have had kid after kid that has personal stories of being able to implement something like touch your head, touch your shoulders, sit down, kick your feet. And that gave enough time for the parent to run and get the child at the body of water. So really establishing things that are really life changing for people. And Aileen, we just do you want to open to, it up for the questions? That was a quick yeah, wrap up. Yeah, and I just wanted to let people know, I mean, what the swim whisper difference is, is we don't, we don't give you strategies by diagnosis, but rather we give you strategies to overcome obstacles. So it, it, it is for all diagnosis, all abilities, and even for some of your swimmers that might not have any diagnosed issues. And it's a, it's a toolbox of techniques that again, weaves in and out of your curriculum, in and out of your strategies, and it works. Um, we've had success even just using the tips from our free resources. And I think that lots of different special needs trainings are out there and they're great and they all offer something. But again, each one has their own difference. So if you are looking for something that would encompass strategies to use in your very next swim lesson with all different abilities, then we really would love to encourage you to explore our options that we're offering. So do you guys have any questions? How long does this last before needing to read? So it's an annual certification program. And each year that you recertify, it's level. So the first is level one, then it would be level two the next year, level three the next year. And with each recertification is more content and a comprehensive examination. 
and different case studies of how to bring this into your next swim lesson. Can you guys hear me? It's Katie. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry. Thank you, ladies, so much for doing this session. I will get to some more questions in just a moment. Um, can you talk, ladies, about the discount that you're doing this week, as well as just the certification program in general, how many hours it takes? Do yeah. you have to be in the U.S.? What does that look like? Yeah, so the yeah, whole... We Aileen, do you want to talk or do you want me to you talk? You can go ahead, Cindy. Okay, because I, I, the picture is different. So, um, oh, hi. The, um, Aileen and I have developed this over the past 20, 21 years. And we really feel like with our team that we have now, it's come, it's on a teachable platform. There's a year one, year two, year three, or you can view it as level one, two, and three, depending on how much training that you're interested in. It's basically about two and a half days of a live workshop. You'll see us when we used to teach back in the day, the swim was for a course live. We also have extra content and video for each roadblock and the adapted swim angels. It's 20 modules. And when you get done with the 20 modules, you're able to take an exam. You're able to print a certification similar to this little fish, but it's a certification saying that you're a certified swim whisperer. And the words around it are autism, anxiety, sensory discomfort, physical, motor, so that people coming to your program know that you have specific training and you are able yearly to get renewed but also some people want to learn more faster. So somebody took it the other day, they loved it. And they said, can I enroll in level two now? And we said, of course, level two is another 20 modules of case studies, case studies and quizzes. And then level three is case studies and quizzes. And because of all of our locations we have here, we're constantly developing strategies and techniques and adding them to our toolbox. And the program is geared towards not giving you a swim curriculum. So you have to have some basis of teaching swimming, WSI, Red Cross, Starfish, Private Swim School. It's going to complement and strengthen your existing, existing swim curriculum by offering a toolbox of strategies and techniques. The first year is 20 modules, similar to about two and a half days of a workshop. And we're offering 50% off. It retails for $7.99. And we're offering it for 50% off, which I believe is $3.99. $3.99. And the next year uh, would retail for $2.99. But if you sign up at this offer, every year ongoing will only be $1.99. And we really, we love what we do. We have been marinating for 21 years. We have a great team with us and we feel like we've taken so many things out there for special needs adaptive swimming. And this is just a really nice way that you can teach faster with less discomfort. And we've had people that, that taught for five years, some people that taught for 30 years, the testimony on, on our website from Coach Marty with Swim America. She literally on the phone was like, I don't know what you could possibly teach me. I'm the best, <laughs> I've been doing this forever. And now she texts me, she texts me success. She texts me the other day. She's added 10 swim whispers to her program. And she said she's using it with her swim teams. She's using it with her typical kids. She's growing her special needs. And people in the community are coming to her because she knows she's trained. So aside from being that excited about it, Aileen, what did I forget? No, I, I know some people were wondering if we do any in-person trainings. And we have a bunch of facilities that have multiple instructors. And we are doing some private trainings for facilities that are already certified in the method. We also have a therapy background. So if you are part of an organization that also does therapy, we do go and do private therapy consults and trainings for programs on the kids that they work with there. But we made this whole certification available online so you can just do it from the comfort of your own home and get started immediately. I mean, listen, with the times that we're going through now, I mean, it's a perfect time, I guess, to invest in education so we can all come back from this stronger and better prepared. So I want to add to that. So thank you so much, Cindy and Aileen. The session, I was thrilled to hear about Swim Angel Fish, and I'm trying to get them to Canada. So hopefully we'll get you ladies up here to Canada sometime soon, because I know you would be invaluable. 
I love what you're saying about adding to existing programs because I think sometimes there's competition between programs for revenue. Well, we do this and we're not doing that. And I love that you're willing to complement with different um, skills. And I know for me, the big ones that you were mentioning during this session were the sensory input, like kids jumping in the pool. I always thought they were just high energy, but now that I better understand what you were saying about switching up my lesson to satiate that sensory impulse, whether it's jumps or playing or sitting at the bottom of the pool, I know that's a big takeaway for me in this session. And I'm sure a lot of people have session takeaways that they're going to either rewatch the webinar, watch all of your free sessions. I would encourage everyone to consider registering for their swim whisperer training. I mean, 50% off is a huge savings. And I know money is tight for a lot of people, but that is a 50% off savings for something that is invaluable. And I want to reiterate that you can use these strategies with anybody, right? Even if you are not yourself personally comfortable teaching adapted lessons, or you don't have an adapted program at your facility. I mean, the takeaways that I've gotten just listening to them, I could implement with any, um, any age or any background. Could you ladies give us just some basic kind of closing guidance? Let's say we, we don't work with a lot of adapted swimmers or we don't know where to start. Maybe our staff are younger, they're less well-trained. How could we maybe kind of start down this path for our facility or for our aquatic programs? It's that's I, such a good question, Katie. I, I just wanted to say one thing and then I'll let you jump in, Cindy. And you know, when we first got started with doing this training, a lot of feedback from other swim schools were like, we don't see these kids yet. So we, we're not going to invest in doing any training. Well, guess what? Everyone is seeing these kids. How many of you are seeing kids and parents aren't even telling you something is wrong, something is going on? If the ratio is one in 59, we are all seeing kids with some type of sensory issue, some type of something that isn't being successful with the traditional way we're doing things. So everyone can benefit. And the best way to get started is by is by soaking up everything on our YouTube channel, Swim Angel Fish YouTube. And if it speaks to you and you want more of it, then you know what the next steps are. You, you know, you just have to contact us at cert at swimangelfish.com and we'll go there. And I, I just beg all of you to please watch two things the parent testimonial, because I cry every time. And it makes us realize we, we have to do something. It is our duty to help these kids and help these families. And the second would be Coach Marty's testimonial, um, because those really speak for themselves. So that would be my recommendation on, on how to get started. What would you say, Cindy? I, I really hope that everybody listening will post the resources, the free resources on their social media, on their website. Those resources is, is our give back after 21 years of working with these communities and with these families. And, and I know um, we talked a lot, Katie, about the lifeguard webinar. And I feel, I feel like we really could avoid dangerous situations for your aquatic facility for lakes and parks. And, and we've seen it even in our own 20 locations. We, we rent space here. And um, you can escalate sometimes a behavior or you can make something worse. And if you just had your lifeguards watch 25 minutes with an aquatic in-service platform of soft signs to approach differently, whether it's somebody with ADHD, somebody with autism, maybe somebody with some physical issues, it really could make your place of, of work stronger and more, more able to handle all of the kids that are coming in. We said it's one in 59 kids, at least in the States, being diagnosed with autism. I know somebody said that, that um, they have some other trainings and things like that. That's phenomenal. Please, please add for your aquatic staff and share soft signs to approach differently the lifeguarding webinar. I, I just think it is full of such simple tips that will avoid an unlikely accident. Yeah, I think uh, I think we'll we'll stop it there. Normally, I would do a big Q and A, but I think with you ladies, you give such to the community in your webinar.
Well, can you guys hear me? Um, I know I know Katie is is bopping out, but if you follow us on Facebook and Instagram as well as our YouTube channel at Swim Angelfish, we can communicate, we can share ideas, and we can just all you know problem solve together. We really want to create a community and. Thank you so much for allowing us to talk to all of you and, and present this really important information. We're so grateful. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time out of your day today to join us. We appreciate it.